Super excited to get things rolling. Um, so our guest today is Ivan Dixon, the managing partner at Dixon Royals. Uh, he recently moved here from uh, North Carolina, and we I've spent some time with him, getting to hear his story, some background, and it is amazing all the things that he's done in the companies that he's worked in um he is a cpa like you have that certification for the cpa uh, and you keep and maintain that which is super cool ivan can you give us just a little bit more uh information about yourself introduce kind of some uh your background where you went to school and how you ended up here absolutely thank you adam i, I really appreciate you hosting today it is great to be here um, thank you to everyone who has joined, who has joined to watch and listen. I hope that this is beneficial for you. Um, and I, I just want to let you know, yes, I did earn my CPA while I was at Ernst & Young and um, went to Marshall University before that, earned a Bachelor of Business Administration with a major in accounting. Go herd. I have recently uh, moved to Pullman, Washington and have been adopted as a Coug, so go Cougs as well. And we have loved it here. My family has really enjoyed our time here in Pullman. Uh, we've got to know, gotten to know some great people and it's just a lovely place to live. Awesome. Absolutely. And that being said, I do want to thank everyone who's uh, helping to sponsor and promote uh, all these webinars. Uh, Southeastern Washington Economic Development Association has been helping to push and promote these along with the city of Pullman and with the uh, Pullman Chamber and Visitor Center, or just Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thank you guys so much for all that you do and how you promote and work with us. We're ah, in this season, we're so excited to be able to promote and help and provide resources to help make sure that we as small businesses are not able to just survive, but to come out of the gates and heading into phase two and I assume phase three, phase four, uh, really running and running our businesses in ways that we might never anticipated, but will lead us into further success. I think that's kind of what Ivan's gonna be talking about today. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Ivan. Thank you, I appreciate it. And Adam, uh, we have a technical issue on this end. There's a message on the screen related to an HDMI cable. So uh, just give you that heads up. So yes, we are here today to talk about uh, how to get back to life as business owners, as uh, citizens, as family members with COVID. There are challenges that we haven't seen before. Um, we hear the word uh, unprecedented a lot around the COVID issue. Um, I think it's unprecedented for us, but certainly not the first time in history that people have faced a challenge. Uh, this is a very wide, widespread, wide scale challenge that we're not used to. And, and for that reason, it has been really a struggle for a lot of people. Um, the good news is this gives us a, an opportunity really to, to expand and to grow in ways that we didn't know that we could or maybe didn't even want to consider. It doesn't mean we have to reinvent the wheel though. Reinventing the wheel um, would make a tough situation even harder. The good news here is there are people available to help, people who want to help, and, and I really have enjoyed seeing people come together more uh, through this situation. I've enjoyed seeing people really growing closer together while we've been separated. And we, we've discovered that we miss uh, social interaction. We miss being with our friends. Uh, for those of us who are huggers, we miss giving hugs and we miss being hugged. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a, a definite a human connection element that, that we've come to appreciate more that maybe we took for granted. So what can we do to help? That's that's kind of the question that I've been asking myself as I sat at home and, and spent time with my family and enjoyed that time and then enjoyed time getting away from my family out of the house for a few minutes and they enjoyed being separated from me for, for minutes at a time. Uh, it gets hard to be cooped up and it, it, it really becomes overwhelming when you start adding on the idea of what's happening to my business? What's happening to the investment? What's happening to the people that I care about? Um, and so I, I talked to Adam and I said, hey, I wanna help. What can I do to just offer some, some suggestions and help for people? And that's how we ended up here today. So, you know, what we really wanna 
think about are, are not just the people process and process, people profits and processes, but we want to talk about the, one of my favorite questions, why? Why are you in business? Why does your business exist? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? And, and in every situation, no matter what you do or how you do it or why you do it, uh, people are gonna be involved. You have employees or customers or suppliers or partners. You need them for everything that you do. And <laughs> when it comes to business, um, I tell people all the time, business would be simple if it weren't for people, right? People can make things challenging, uh, but without people, you don't have a business. So we have to figure out how to, how to face those challenges. So how do we make uh, this situation better? How do we make the best of it? And how do we grow through this? How do you make your business work? Where's the magic? What is the magic of your business? And, and how do you make it? If, if you can stop and think about those things, then we can also think about what we need to do to, to make some sense out of this situation. Um, and actually, just to kind of uh, walk through it, that feel free to throw that into the chat. Like, why why do you why are you in business? Like, what's been that? What was that heart's desire originally that helped spawn and move things forward? Go ahead and throw that into into the chat. Absolutely. Uh, this we we love the interaction and and love the questions and would love to be able to address some of those as we go along. So, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people say along the way, I can't wait to get back to normal. I cannot wait for things to get back to normal. And there's an aspect of that that I agree with. Um, you know, I, I miss getting to go to the movies with my friends or family. I miss getting to go to restaurants or, or just not have restrictions on how close you can be to people to have a conversation, how many people you can get together with and, and spend time with and enjoy, enjoy your life with. Um, but when it comes to business, I want, I want to really challenge that, uh, the idea of getting back to normal. And, and I want to ask you, you know, why, why do you want to get back to normal? Could there be a better way? As I think back through history and companies that have really excelled um, through, through challenges and through good times and bad alike, it, it's the companies that really change things up. They find a different way to do something. They find a different way to offer a solution. So the big challenge for us in, in this current environment is what can we do differently instead of just accepting that we need to get back to normal? Because maybe back to the old normal isn't possible for you. Maybe your business just isn't gonna exist the way it did. So what can we do now to, to find a better way and, and when we do that, let's, let's see if we can't help other people along the way. Is there a better way to do things? What's your why? And that's another question that I'd love for you to answer if you wanna put comments in is what is your why? Why do you do what you do? So when we create that new normal, how do we do that? Um, one of the first things I would suggest is be creative and, and being creative means looking for a different way to do things accept and seek help from others. You know, it's, it's really amazing how much people want to help each other and how willing people are to help if you just ask. And one of the greatest things I, I've seen is that, you know, wisdom comes and grows when we realize that we don't know everything. And if you can realize that you don't know everything and somebody else might have a way to, to look at it, that's great. Because what I really see is when you start asking those questions, why, and you get other people and you get this, this perspective difference, then that's where magic really happens in a company and, and in relationships. Um, I, I remember this experience I had with a company I was working with one time and they were a huge multinational uh, nickel super alloy manufacturer. And one of the situations that they were facing that, that helped me to come in to work at that company was they were in crisis. They had been through bankruptcy and the company had been around for 83 years. They had over a thousand employees worldwide um, and, and they were in trouble. And so the, the chief financial officer who helped get them through bankruptcy was just about to exit. And we were introduced to each other and, and found an opportunity to work together. So I went to work with him as he was the new CEO and he gave me some challenges to work on. 
And one of those was as a team, we put in lean manufacturing for this company. So the first um, opportunity that we chose to work on to really show the workforce how serious the, the company was about fixing the, the issues and getting through the crisis and coming out stronger was on a piece of machinery that had been there for 82 of the 83 years the company had been in business. 82 year old piece of equipment. Wow. It was a, a draw bench, yeah, this big, big, huge bench that pulled metal to stretch it. And it was making seamless tube. So it pulled it through a die that, that maintained the, the diameter of the pipe and the wall thickness that they needed. Mm -hmm. So the question was, how can we make this a better process? And if any of you have been involved with lean before, you might uh, recognize the concept of a spaghetti chart or spaghetti diagram. Basically, it's a picture of the work floor as it, as it exists, and you put your pencil on the paper where the worker is, and you tell him, okay, do your job. We're going to watch, and we're going to time you, and we're going to see how things work, and then we'll start asking questions. So we put our pencil down on the paper, and he starts working, and, and by the end of the process, what the picture looks like is a plate of spaghetti because he's all over the place, moving here and there and back and forth. So that's when we got to start asking the question, why? And we asked the question and, you know, there was one piece of equipment attached to this uh, process that was a tank full of uh, a salt bath and it was super hot salt so that the metal would be dipped in and flash dry. And the question is, why do you do that? He said, well, because the metal needs to be clean before it goes to the next step of dipping it in oil uh, so that the oil will adhere to the metal. And, and I said, oh, that's really interesting. I, I don't understand. So we watched the process and they dip the metal into the salt bath, bring it out, it flash dries. The crane moves it over to the next tank, drops it into this big vat of oil uh, that has a hazardous placard on it that it's heated oil and, and that it's too hot to be safe, so stay away. Uh, they lift it up, drip, 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 oil back into the, into the tank. And then they hoist it over to the rack for the machine and drip, drip, drip all over the sidewalk, the walking area within the yellow stripes. So then the guy has to take the dry all and spread it around on the oil on the floor and clean that up and stop his process so that he keeps it safe for people to walk through, including himself. Um, and, and then he goes on with the process. So I, I go back to this tank with the salt bath and I said, but I don't understand, why do you do that? He said, well, because it has to clean the metal, the oil won't stick to it. And I said, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I, I remember seeing pictures of oil spills and there are people cleaning ducks and turtles and, and all these creatures that have got oil everywhere. I said, I'm pretty sure those animals weren't clean, but the oil stuck every, everywhere there was. So why does it have to be metal clean? Oh, well, it, it's the way that it has to be. Uh, okay, we're getting somewhere. Now I'm starting to get some pushback of <laughs> this is how it is, right? So we asked why again. And he said, look, I do it this way because that's the way I was trained. I was told to do it that way. Ah, yes, that's the magic answer. That's what we want to hear. I'm doing it this way because that's the way it's done, right? That's the way we've always done it. When you can get to that answer, you, you know you're making some progress. So we said, okay, well, who trained you? And he said, oh, it was so-and-so, Jim Johnson over in, over in the cellar department. Oh yeah, we know Jim. So the manager calls Jim over and says, Jim, why do we do this salt bath? So it was all about 15 years ago, a salesman came through and convinced the, the head of operations that you really would get benefit of cleaning the metal before you put the oil on it. Wow. Really? Yeah. What do you think about it? I think it's stupid. It doesn't work. We're just wasting our time. But that's what they decided to do, so we do it right? So we said, all right, let's get rid of that thing and see what happens. And we made progress. And that's the kind of thing that, that where you start asking for other people to look at your process, that you can have some magical moments because we all have different experiences. We all have different recollections and memories, and we see things differently, even standing right next to each other. And, and that that different perspective really colors our, our vision and our judgment of how things work. And that can be a really powerful thing for, for people to understand and embrace somebody else's perspective. So when you can do that and when you can take the time to say, you know what, there might be a better way to do what I'm doing, then, then you can have something magical. So Adam, you and I were talking earlier about some 
some other companies throughout history that that had faced some challenges. Um, yeah, yeah, we were. <clears throat> I didn't know if we want to wait for the air slide or not, but the yeah, one of the things we were talking about is there's so many different industries, there's so many different changes, and there's now um, more regulations to try and make sure that we're compliant and safe with everything. Um, but, you know, I, I was thinking about uh, J.C. JCPenney's. Um, started in 1916. They made it through the Great Depression. They made it through World War I, World War II, um, which was huge economic impacts. They've made it through um, the economic downturn in 2008. They made it through the uh, the bubble bur dot com bubble burst in early 2000s. They made it through Y2K like the rest of us. Yet this last Sunday, they just filed bankruptcy. Um, and and in this and give uh, giving some context, they were on track to have one of their first profitable quarters in years. Um, and then with COVID, they it just it couldn't fly anymore and and so Ivan what, what was your thoughts on that yeah so you know this um that's a really good point and and what I suggest is as I look at JC Penney yes they made it through the 1916 issues they made it through World War One and the Spanish flu and the Great Depression and World War Two, uh, but they didn't make it through 2016 and I think what happened to them is they did not they did not change with the times of, of society. They didn't change with technology. They didn't change their business model. Um, they felt like they were too big to fail. Mm -hmm. and really, they've been failed for many, many years. And and I'm surprised, really, that, that they just filed bankruptcy. I would have expected it much sooner. Um, but they, they don't have the infrastructure to ship to homes and to shop on the internet. And, and they didn't move along with technology they stuck with the concept of we have the brick and mortar corner store of the mall. You'll come to us, shopping malls are never going away. So you come to us and you'll buy what you need. And people discovered other ways to shop. The internet right. changed that. What, and, and what's confusing to me is like JCPenney's is kind of easy to pick on because they are such a big retailer. I know Bon Marche slash Macy's, I still call it Bon Marche uh, <laughs> uh, since when they got bought out. They, we just had Harbor Freight move into Pullman. And to me, that's a very traditional retail, like, yeah, you can buy it online, but I, I need a socket to work on my car today. Um, why, why do you think Harbor Freight is able to move and expand? Because we, we have one in Lewiston. You know, there's one in Spokane, there's one in Tri-Cities. Why do we need our Harbor Freight? Why are, what are they doing that uh, JCPenney's can't? Well, I'm, I'm not sure how they picked the location for their new stores, but, you know, I've always looked at Harbor Freight as more of a niche uh, operator. I think of them as a more specialized store where you go for something very specific and, and they have what you need. Um, I think they do a good job with their marketing and with their sales that they have where you get something free when you come into the store and, mm. and buy anything. Um, and, and what ends up happening is, you know, you walk into the store to get your free thing. Oh, yeah, I need... I need that magnetic uh, cup holder that goes into my toolbox to hold the nuts and bolts that always get lost or, or your socket for your car or whatever it is that you need to get and you lose all the time. Oh yeah, I need one. I'm going to go pick that up. And then while you're there, you see something else that suddenly you need, right? And they right. have what you need and you buy it. Um, and, and so they continue to do that. So I think they've found a way to really uh, connect with people that's different and they don't to me look like the big box store. Um, they look a little more specialized. So mm. it, they have found a way to operate and they found a way to grow and they're selective about their markets. And, and I think they've got data that drives, you know, what their selection process is. And, and they, I hope they've made a good choice and I hope they continue to grow and be successful that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to reiterate, if I'm hearing, so in, in this uh, example of retail, you feel that they are succeeding because they are specialized and more niche and people kind of know what to expect when they're going to the store. Yeah, I would think so. And you know, you, you're working on a project and 
I, I don't know if you're like me, but if I'm working on a project at home, it's not really a project unless I've gone back to the hardware store three times. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right? true. It just it never fails. If it, if it's a small plumbing project or carpentry or whatever. Um, it never fails that I'm going to forget something the first time. The second time I'm going to go and get the wrong thing because I'm in a hurry and frustrated that I forgot it in the first place. Then I get home and realize it's the wrong size or the wrong turn or whatever. And then I go back a third time and get it, get it right. And then it's really a project and then I can complete it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, we're, we're going to continue to need that kind of, of thing. And it's really, I haven't found a way to be efficient enough in my projects that I can order my supplies through the internet uh, one time and get my project done right. Yeah, yeah. And so then, and, and I want to bring up a, something that Brandon mentioned, Blockbuster is a good example of not future-proofing. Is I don't know that niching is future-proofing, but do you think that those are somewhat related? Well, I think it's I think it's another flavor of the same concept of find a way to differentiate, right? You, you want to be different. You want to gain a competitive advantage some way um, and, and you want to find the way to, to innovate. So uh, Blockbuster didn't innovate. Netflix came along and, and offered the ability to go on your computer and order a movie that you wanted and the disc would show up in the mail. They made it super simple. You put the disc back in the envelope when you're done and just drop it back in the mailbox and you don't even have to put postage on it. It goes back on their dime and, and it's done. So they were a disruptor. They were a disruptor to the model that Blockbuster was using. Blockbuster had been hugely successful with it. Uh, and there were family video stores since the 80s all over the country. Yeah. Um, and, and there aren't that many of those left anymore either because now you have streaming, right? And, and Netflix, when they got into the streaming concept to myself, I thought, boy, I really like the disc concept. I don't know that I want to pay for streaming and whether it's going to be good enough. And now it's, it's just the way life is. Right. And right. We, we have all moved to that and we love it. So be a disruptor, find a way to do something different, differently um, in a way that you can provide an experience for your customer that they can't get somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. And so then as we look at, um, sorry, I was looking at my notes. And I think another example with that too is I know restaurants are really having to adapt and to be unique. Um, I find it fascinating. Like I, I like Popo's quite a bit. We go there for bubble tea. That's one of my wife's favorite things to get. I, I think every single time I've been there, there's been a line. Um, and they haven't ever really promoted their drive through window. But it's always been like uh, the delivery drivers or are the only ones who are allowed to use the drive through window. And then now all of a sudden it's like exclusively drive through window only. Form a line, let's get it moving. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, you, you have a, you have a health uh, issue in the in the community and rules are put in place to keep people safe and those businesses now that are able to adapt to that are finding a way um, one of the other local restaurants you see on their sign out front hey you can order on our facebook page and we will deliver our food to you what a great concept right i, I wouldn't have thought to go that route and they found a way to make it work um, the the days of restaurants having delivery service felt like they were long past and now there are specialized services that do that well maybe those specialized services don't exist in every community um, some of those big specialized services don't do as well here um, but if the restaurants got together could form their own delivery service and and share that cost that might be a way that works for them right yeah um, about finding finding a different way to change things it, the current situation reminds me of another experience i had I was working with a, um, a healthcare company in the medical billing field and practice management. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I had suggested was, hey, we, we need to let people work from home. We're having a hard time finding these specialized medical coders in the environment, in the uh, local economy, right? Yeah. This region, there just aren't enough people trained to do that in this population. 
one way to get past that is if we work remotely, you can have people all over the country or world who work for your company and can do the coding and, and get this done. So the management team said, wow, that sounds like a great idea. Let's explore this. So we started working through it and we were coming up with the, the ideas of how to work from home. And the, the VP of operations was justifiably super concerned about losing quality. And, and her issue yeah. was, how am I going to make sure that everybody does their job if I'm not there to manage them in person? And how am I going to make sure that people are, are doing the full quantity of work we need and the quality of work that we need, right? And so the suggestion was, well, look, I think we can fix that pretty simply. Let's use data. And we did an analysis. Here's how much each person in your organization is billing on a weekly basis right now, on average, over the six month period, 12 month, 18 month period. So we looked at the data and said, these are the current um, productivity numbers. Now, we would expect working from home that you would be more productive because we're cutting out the water cooler chat and we're cutting out the disruptions and, yeah. and all the things that happen when you're in the office environment. Um, what if we raise the number by 20% and say, all right, here, Adam, this is your productivity over the last year. Uh, we're going to allow you to work from home and we listen to all the benefits of you can work in your pajamas. You can work <laughs> Uh, whenever you want to do your work. And the VP was like, no, 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 no. I need them available eight to five. You know, and so I got to ask my favorite question. Why? Why do you need to work from eight, eight to five? Well, what if the client calls and I have to call them and ask a question? I said, I'm pretty sure the client would understand if you tell them, hey, we will always answer your question within one day. We will always have an answer back to you within one business day. And, and that lets your people work whenever they want, because what if I'm a worker who specializes in, in focusing really hard between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m.? And that's just me, I'm a night owl and I can work during those hours. And I could get eight hours worth, worth of work done in three hours. Well, we can't have that. We've got to have people working eight hours get paid eight hours. And I, I pushed back, I said, but why? You, you just decided that the metric was, here's the quantity of work that I need and here's the quality. We have this error uh, amount that they're allowed. So if they turn in the quantity, by the way, we're increasing at 20%. So if they do 120% of what they did before with the same or better quality, your client's gonna be happy. You should be happy. And, and eventually we got her there, right? But it was hard and, and I kept thinking, why is this hard for her to get there? And the answer in the end, what I came up with was it was a matter of control. She mm. was going into an unknown and felt like she didn't have control and she wasn't sure what was going to happen. So there was this anxiety that would build about what might happen. What well, might be done wrong. It might crash. It might collapse. It might be a disaster. And, and the response to that was, and it might be a huge success. And so the reason I, I share that story right now is think about our current situation where everybody's working from home and has been now for a couple of months. We found ways to make it work. When, when Zoom um, was the, all of a sudden the new popular, this is the way to make it work thing and everybody was so excited about it, I chuckled a little bit because I've been using it for over a dozen years and loved it, right? And so I said, good for Zoom. I love that everybody's catching on and that this will be a good tool for this situation. Now, what, what we're missing right now compared to the work from home that, that I helped initiate so many years ago at this company is we built in social interaction into the plan to work from home mm -hmm. because we knew we wanted to stay connected with the employees. Yeah. We wanted them to stay connected with each other and we wanted those relationships to be strong. So we built in a, a, work day in the office once every two weeks where they would come in for a few hours in the morning and you could do some group training and you could just have some cake or have a lunch or have some <laughs> meal together because face it we like food right food's a good thing some of us like it too much but so, we built that in and right now we're missing that so we've got to find a way in our current environment to give people the opportunity for social interaction and I think that's going to come with time as we find it safe to do so. 
So then taking a, a small step back here, um, I, I, love, I love that idea of like, okay, why, why, why? How, how would you recommend businesses try to roll through that idea of, I need to think differently. Why do we do the things we do? And how, how is there, a, is there like a process or a recommended guide to, for each company to kind of walk that a little bit? Well, I, I think that, you know, going back to the, um, the lean example, lean manufacturing, there's a role on, on each team that they call the nine-year-old. I always said it's probably more like a five-year-old in the experience with my kids, but you know, <laughs> it's the person who asks why to everything. Why is the sky blue? Why is the water wet? Why is the grass that color? Why does it feel this way? You know, just question everything because you're, you're that curious person who wants to learn. And, and then it comes back to this idea of perspective. Um, sometimes you can do that within your own organization. Sometimes you need to bring somebody in from the outside. Sometimes you find that really beneficial to get that outside vantage point um, to look at things and, and to really challenge because it is super easy to get into your routine and this is my process and this process works and then you buy into it and you will then fail to see when there might be a different way to do it or you might discount it and say, nope, this works. I'm good with my process. We're not changing. So having that, that outside look sometimes is necessary. Um, but if you're an organization that's big enough, you can do it with your own people by pulling somebody from a different department in somebody who's never done that job before that you're looking at and have them start asking the questions. Um, so there are lots of ways to get to it. You can do it internally, you can do it externally, but you really need to just come at it with the, the idea of, we want you to question. We want you to ask, why are you doing this? And please don't take it personally, Adam, when I start challenging you on why you do your job the way you do it. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I just want to know if there might be a different perspective we can get to. Right. We're still buds. And at the end of the day, most of the answers on how to make the process better are going to come from the person doing the job. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they just might need to be prodded to find a different way to do it. So then I'll, I'll ask one last clarifier and then, then we can keep moving on. Um, so I, I, I do find this uh, type of this context really fascinating because when I when I started my business, I, I had advice from everybody telling me how I should run my business and asking me why, why I should do it this way. And so over time, I, I've had to create like this, this filter, um, mostly for my dad, because my dad doesn't quite understand that people on the internet pay me money uh, to do promotions. Um, that, that still boggles him a little bit. <laughs> um, so, so I, I have this filter now of, of people and information. Is there a, a way to help m me pass that filter? You know, it, as I'm trying to invite people in or if I'm training a new employee um, who doesn't quite get it, um, how, how do I break out of my filter and, and get into that? Yeah, so, you know, as you started uh, describing that scenario, I also thought of being a new parent, right? Everybody wants to tell you how to be the parent and how to handle every situation. And it, it, there comes a point where you just have to put the filter on and say, all right, thank you for your advice. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Um, but being a parent, and, and especially during this current COVID situation where we're now not only parents and we're not only uh, trying to run a business or, or be an employee and not only trying to be a family member. A lot of us are also school teachers full time. Uh, and we, we have learned a little bit of appreciation for how much our school teachers do for our children and for us on a regular basis. Um, and, and coming from a family of school teachers, I, I've always appreciated teachers, but the current situation has made me appreciate it even more. Um, the, the popular meme that's that's gone around the internet a little bit now that says, I don't know when they uh, decide on next year, but I just hope my kids have a different teacher. Um, I have agreed with that. <laughs> I hope I'm not their teacher again next year on a full-time basis. But I had an amazing math teacher in high school. Um, Mrs. Buchanan was my math teacher. And she has, she has impacted my life in so many ways. And especially as, as a coach, as a parent, 
as a, a teacher, as an employer, as I work with people and as a consultant, what I learned from her is there's, you know, there's an adage, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, there's more than one way to do a math problem. And so as I've worked with my kids on math and I can see them struggling with what I'm trying to teach them on the concept of how to, how to solve this problem, I say, okay, you didn't get that one. Let's try another one. Here's another way to look at it. And I teach them the second method for solving that math problem. And sometimes it takes three or four different methods before a certain kid picks up on here's how you do it. Um, that's, that's kind of the, how we have to view ourselves and learning these new things is realize that the same approach doesn't work for everybody. It, it's not the same answer for every situation. There might be a bunch of right answers. There might be many right ways to do it. And so if we can accept that for ourselves, that there might be many right ways to get to the, to the same result. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be that, that the third option that we learn is so much easier that we're super efficient and can do twice as much with it. That's the way I want to do it. You know, my kids get amazed when, and when we're having a discussion and somebody is talking about some numbers and my wife says, Oh yeah, I saw this on sale and it was 20% off. What would that cost? And I tell her, you know, and she's like, how kids are like, how'd you do that so quickly? And I said, well, I just learned to do the math in my head and, and I show them the way and they're like, that's not how we learned it in school. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's not, but that's what works for me. I can do it the way you were taught. Um, I could do it this other way, or I could do it the way that works for me and, and it's quicker and more efficient and it works. Yeah. And, and that's really how it is in business too, is there, there's more than one way to get to the right answer. Uh, thank goodness we're not all the same. If we were all the same, how boring would this life be? Or how infuriating would it be <laughs> to have more than one me in the world? Um, just ask my wife, it, would, it might be too much to bear. But there's more than one way to get to those answers. And, and so again, it comes to that perspective and it comes with understanding that we don't know everything. So as we gain that wisdom, as we gain that opportunity, um, to, to look at things differently, then we'll see that we might find a better way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the next part that you're going into, I think really speaks to that really well. And, and Brandon, uh, he's, he's been in the chat quite a bit and he, he put it, uh, another way of how can we see the best way that works for each of us and, and having that perspective from everybody else. And I, as much as I think college tries to help us with that, uh, they always talk about having different lenses to see things. I, I don't know that we, we get enough experience. Um, and if we don't have enough experience, I love the idea of accepting and seeking that help from others who do have that wisdom to, to help us. Um, I appreciate it too. Cause, and, and on perspective, I'll, I'll let you continue with the slides too. Cause I think, I think that just segues really nicely. Yeah, you know, so I, I've been so fortunate in, in my career to work with so many companies around the world um, that were in crisis mode, that were in a situation where cash flow was, was drying up, where they had to find a way. Um, you know, with, with your profitability, you can show a profit on your books and be absolutely accurate from an accounting standpoint and be within the, the confines of the law and still fail. You know, there are lots of companies that were profitable on, on paper that failed. And the reason they fail is because of cash flow. You've got to have cash. And, and so getting to see that in so many different areas and helping to, to find solutions for that has been a lot of fun for me. And, but what I've noticed and is, you know, especially now, people are scared and people are hurting because of that unknown and that feeling, like I mentioned earlier, of the control we're not necessarily in control of our companies like we thought we were before it, it didn't take a whole lot to just grind everything to a halt just just a little virus right this microscopic yeah. organism and all of a sudden the world shut down so that's scary and people have to face the fact that you know there are feelings involved now this isn't just running a business and it's not just doing your your daily thing and We've got a checklist of our, our daily tasks and there's more than that involved. Now, now we have to really 
be concerned about people's feelings and fear and, and helping them get through that. So, you know, what can we do to recognize that, that maybe we could help somebody else? Maybe we can look at them and say, hey, it's okay. Here's another thing to think about, right? But this, is, this becomes so personal for a business owner who has invested everything into this business and they thought they had a, a great plan and a great control and they had thought about all the you know, contingencies and the risks and they had managed and mitigated. And now all of a sudden something comes up that nobody, um, with maybe the exception of Bill Gates, saw coming, right? <laughs> And, and now you've got a situation that you're just not in control. So a big part of, a big part of why I wanted to talk about this and this idea of perspective and, and having other people come in and help you is because it's not a sign of weakness, right? It's not a sign of weakness to admit that, that you're scared. It's not a sign of weakness to admit that you don't know everything. Those are really strengths and and if we look at this idea of perspective and what people are going through, and now is a really hard time, um, this slide that I've got up with some not so good things that people experienced if they were born in the early part of the 1900s with World War I, the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, World War II, um, go on with the list of, of wars and rumors of wars and all of the hard things in life. Um, you know, there were some good things that came along too. And, and I say good-ish because maybe not all of them are great in everybody's mind and these are open to interpretation, but you, you can see this list with automobiles and commercial aviation. You've got computers and the internet and all of these different things that, that have come along that who had dreamt of these things 100 years ago, right, or 110 years ago. And so you have some bad things happen and then you have all these great things that come afterwards. And... And I share that just to say, this is a hard time and it's scary for a lot of people. A lot of us, I, you know, I have my moments. Um, there are good days and there are bad days. It's hard to be confined at home when you're a people person. Um, it's hard to be confined at home even if you don't always like being with people because too much of a good thing can really be, be hard on us, right? Um, so just realizing that good things come out of this stuff too. We've seen people just grow more caring about each other and, and I hope that that sticks after this is done. I hope that we can hold on to this feeling of caring about our neighbors and caring about other people and helping their businesses and finding ways to support people. I really hope that we can hold on to that. And, and that hope is what we need. Hope for tomorrow, hope for a better day, hope for an opportunity to continue to do what we love. Um, and, and that's what I'm hoping to share and to convey and and to give and if we could each give a little bit for other people then then we really can have hope mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i think that's good i i think there's i think we sometimes doubt the ways that we innovate i think the curbside deliveries i think the ways um i know some salons are have sold more product online through e-commerce like like their shampoos and their conditioners and other like care products um, in the past couple months, more so than they did in years past combined. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. there's, there's all these different ways and nuances that we can innovate the little, little odds and ends. And then as we shift into that new normal, we can keep that, what we've learned, implement what was worked in the past and really, create a not a mashup but a maybe this is just forcing us to innovate in ways that we've been resisting for a long time yeah for sure for sure but the the beauty out of this situation is it it's an opportunity mm -hmm. and, yeah. and here's our chance to make something better right and yeah. it might be that you can't go back to the way things were. You can't go back to normal. Your business might not have the old normal available and you are forced to innovate and you are forced to do something different so that, so that you can not just survive, but thrive. Mm -hmm. And, and I really think that that's a great opportunity for all of us at this point. So at this point um, I'm done and would love any further questions that we have uh, from the crowd. If you have any more yeah 
Yeah, and we'll um, and let us know too. We'll I'm more than happy to unmute if you guys want to. Uh, you know, just use the chat system, or if you do, you have a couple questions that you want. Uh, we're more than happy to do those live, um, and so we can enable you to be able to use your microphones as well. Wait just a little bit for all the typing. Let's see here. Brennan asks, uh, what, business, what questions should business owners be asking a business consultant such as yourself that they often never do? Oh, that's a great question. And I think one of the best things that, that you can ask anybody is, you know, what don't I know? What am I not looking at? What, what can I be doing differently or what should I think about that I'm not thinking about? And just asking that question then opens the door for that other perspective to come in, right? That, that shows that we are putting ourselves in a, a place of humility where we recognize that we don't know everything um, and we might not even know the question to ask. <laughs> my, my very first uh, client when I was out of college at Ernst & Young um, as working as an auditor with Ernst & Young before I did computer system security, um, the client was a clothing manufacturer. And the guy who was the chief financial officer of that client had been a manager in the office of Ernst Young that I had worked out of. So he grew up through Ernst Young and then went to the client and became their chief financial officer after, after it's been about 10 years with EMY. So uh, his name is Dale and Dale would have so much fun with the new kids that would come in to ask the audit questions because he designed a lot of the audit techniques that we were using and he recognized what we were trying to get to. He knew the end goal of our questions and he knew when we were asking the wrong question. Now, Dale was always very careful to answer honestly whatever question I would ask him. He would answer it 100% honestly. Um, he would answer exactly the question that I asked. And I would ask the question, he would smile or chuckle, and he'd answer, and I'd write it down. I'm writing down my answers on my notepad. And then I'd finish with my list of 20 questions, and I would go back to the office and start typing in my answers and, and coming up with my work documents. And I would hand the document to my supervisor and the supervisor looked at it and said, mm, this isn't the right thing. You're going to need to try again. You, you got something wrong here. Wow. I'd say, okay, let me see. What did I get wrong? So he'd make me think through it and I'd think through it and I'd say, okay, um, here's what I asked. Here's the answer I got. And my, my boss would say, okay, now think about where you're trying to go. What are you testing? with these questions and what are you trying to, to determine uh, with your question? And I'd think about it and be like, oh yeah, I missed it. I, I went a little bit off to the, to the side. So I would revise my question, I'd go back and I'd walk into Dale's office and he'd just start laughing. He said, I knew you'd be back, right? Because he knew I didn't even know the right questions to ask. Yeah. And he was taking the opportunity to help train me and to teach me to ask the right question. Um, which is hard. It takes practice to do that. And it takes understanding and it takes looking at the bigger picture of what you're trying to accomplish uh, to figure out what the right question is. So a lot of times uh, if we are in a position where somebody wants to help us, the best thing we can do may be to say, what am I missing? What's the right question for me to ask? Yeah. And that gets us, you know, further out of our own perspective and to look at things differently. So I, I'm going to, there's a question earlier and I, I did want to uh, ask this and I, I think there's a good timing for it in terms of services or uh, retailers, hospitality, or even professional services, who, who do you think has the biggest to gain if they just did X? Wow, that's, that's a tough question because I think every business has so much to gain. It, it would be hard for me to figure out who has the most. I think this is the time when, when each business can, can just really find a way to catapult themselves forward by, by making the right decisions at this point. 
Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Businesses typically, in my experience, um, when times are good, it's hard as a consultant to get people to want to bring you in to fix things yeah. because they're like, why, why do I need to fix things? That's going great. I'm throwing money all over the place. Um, and then when things go bad, it's, oh my gosh, we need to do something differently, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, what I would suggest is when things are going really well is a great time to, to challenge what you're doing and find other ways because it gives you that cushion. Right now, maybe people don't have that cushion because we're in the crisis mode um, and we need to make those changes. But th this, is, this is such a huge opportunity to level playing fields um, with everybody being stopped for a time with this thing that there's, there's no one industry or one area where people are going to benefit more than necessarily another. I think everybody has that opportunity at this point. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I think your assessment is accurate on uh, the timing, timing of it. I, I had a client ask me that just yesterday of, um, you know, what, what should my timing be? You know, things are really good. Do I really need to be spending money right now. Um, and, I, and I leveled with him on that of this is this is the perfect time to work on building the brand, um, getting out that messaging, introducing yourself to people. Um, and, and, you know, if, if for whatever reason, if things shift or we turn into a slow season, um, it's going to be harder to want to do that type of marketing or to really focus in on build the brand. Um, even though, even in slow times, that's the best time to, is a really good time to evaluate your processes. How are we doing? What should we be doing? How can we make it more efficient? How, how do we want to make people feel? after they engage with us. Um, and you know, Brandon Chapman mentioned in the chat that some businesses are gaining more brand loyalty right now and during the season. Um, I think that's absolutely accurate. I think there's, we, I, I think we must always be vigilant uh, in, in going after improving ourselves and our businesses. Well, absolutely. And, and you know, I think as long as we as, as each business owner um, looking at our business, if we remember our why, why are we doing what we're doing? What is our reason for existing? And if we can be true to that, mm -hmm. um, then we can find the ways to, to really excel at this point. And so everything we, sh we do should start with that why and then grow from there. And, and the most important thing after the why is who right? And those mm -hmm. are our employees, our partners. We need to be able to take care of each other. And companies that really excel um, tend to be the ones who take care of their people the best, right? Yeah. And, and when you take care of your people, then your people take care of your customers. And you don't have to mandate that this is how we treat our customers. It becomes a culture because everybody knows you as a business owner care about your employees and you put them first. And with them, you care about your customers because they are the reason that you're there. You take care of them and you find ways to solve their problems and make their lives easier. Then you really do well. Those are the companies that I see that really excel and, and outperform. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in the context of today's topic, uh, do you have any books or podcasts that you recommend? Well, you know, I. Shameless plug, I've really enjoyed the ones that Pullman Marketing's been putting out. Um, those, those are kind of the ones I've focused on. So, <laughs> um, there, there was a book that I read long ago that I find that still, um, still resonates with me. And I, I go back to it very frequently in my, in my business life and in my personal life. Um, and it was uh, Colin's book, Good to Great. And, and oh, yeah. in that book, he looked at companies that had outperformed the stock market over a period of many years and he looked back through the state analysis to the point where they were just mediocre or average or, or maybe even slightly better than the market. And then something happened and they took off. And over time, that rise was just really um, big and there was some huge differentiator. And he wanted to understand what that was. So he went into each of those companies and, and talked with the people there and said, what did you do? How did you do what you did? What happened? And from that, he distilled several uh, concepts and, and, 
and ideas that then could be applied to other companies. And I think that one really has a lot of good um, ideas that, that really even apply to this situation now. If we can find those ways to make that happen in our companies, they could be useful tools. So that would be the one book that, that I would suggest. Yeah, and I, I'd take you back with that. There's two other books that uh, dovetailed uh, by Phil Collins and um, Mortensen, I think, Mort or Morton. Um, and that's Great by Choice and then Great at Work. Um, great by Choice uses a lot of the same data that Good to Great has. Um, but then I believe Morton went and did another study on how good workers outperform others. Like, and, and that idea of like, okay, well, if I could do 40 hours a week work, worth of work, but the person who does 35 hours a week actually outperforms me every time, how do they do it? Um, and, and using large data sets to go through and prove it. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, the, the idea of, of reading any of those books and watching podcasts is to just always keep growing personally and professionally. So um, I hope that today we've, we've offered some ideas and some, uh, something to think about and something that might help each of you who have watched. Thank you for watching so much. Um, thank you so much for watching. And I hope that we've provided some idea for you to think on and something that will sit with you and, and spur you to uh, find a way to make your company great and help the people around you and, and just help lift each other up. So thank you again for, for your time. And I appreciate you attending. Yeah, absolutely. And at this time, I do want to make sure we mention the Southeastern Washington Economic Development Association for all their assistance, uh, helping put this together along with the Pullman Chamber, City of Pullman, SBDC, um, and then also the Pullman Downtown Association, I believe also uh, promoted us in trying to get as many people going. Um, one question that's in here uh, that came in at the last second, uh, Ivan, what services do you offer in your consulting? that would be the best taken advantage of during this rebuilding time. Oh, great. Well, thank you. I, I, was, uh, I was trying not to put in a shameless plug for myself, but thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> so I, I love helping people. I love helping companies. Um, I love problem solving. I've been a creative problem solving person really my whole life. Um, and I love technology to do that where we can, but relationships are, are really drivers. Um, you know, I help my clients with their accounting issues. I help them when necessary with tax issues. I'm not a tax expert, but I do have training enough to, to know how to ask the right questions and then look in the right places to find answers or, or to point them to better partners than me sometimes. Um, I help with processes. I help people look at, uh, you know, why are you doing that? A lot of the things that we talk about are the things that I do with my clients. How can we make your company better by challenging the processes that you have? How can we make it a, a place where people just love to come to work where your employee loyalty soars, um, because when those things happen, your customer loyalty is gonna take off too. And when you have employee loyalty, customer loyalty, then you are gonna have the cash flow, and that's gonna come out of it and be a result. So you will get to do what you love and you will get to change the world by doing it. And you will help a lot of people along the way. So that that's what we do at, at Dixon Royals. We come in and help people find ways to solve their problems. We are fixers. We're creative about it. Um, we've taught creative problem solving. We teach people skills. I've been a coach my whole life. I've been involved with the Boy Scouts for many, many years. Uh, I've been a parent for many years at this point. Um, and so we like relationships. We like helping people build relationships and make them stronger. And, and that's what we do. If you need help, please give me a call or send me an email. I'd love to come in and help your company. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We're uh, just past the three o'clock hour. Thank you once again, Ivan and everyone else for attending. And uh, this is so good. And we're, we're here and glad that we can help and serve and move things forward. Um, we will be sending the recording out uh, here in a little bit. And so if you guys want to shoot that out to everyone else that should have been on this call, but might not have been able to attend because they had other Zoom meetings to attend to, uh, we'll be sending that out. And once again, thank you guys so much. Um, and have a wonderful day. I know it's raining, but I, I like the smell of the rain. I like, I enjoy this time. So that's just me, but 
All right. Take care and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.